Good afternoon, everyone. You're all very welcome to uh, the Moot Courtroom in the School of Law, Queen's. Uh, delighted to see you here and everyone online as well. You're all very, very welcome. And again, we'll try and manage this uh, hybrid event. My name is Colin Harvey. I'm professor in the School of Law. I'm also director of the Human Rights Centre, and this is part of the Human Rights Centre seminar series. Really delighted to welcome today to uh, Queen's Daniel Holder, who's a deputy director of CAJ. And it's fair to say that we have a very, very long association in the Human Rights Centre and the School of Law actually with CAJ over many, many years. CAJ itself is an award-winning NGO. Round of applause for CAJ. Um, they've won, you, you can keep me right here, the Reebok Human Rights Award and the Council of Europe Human Rights Prize as well. So really very distinguished, the leading you know, human rights organization in, in the region. In terms of the Human Rights Centre and myself and, and other work, I could spend the rest of the next hour uh, outlining the, the many collaborations that have happened. And it's really one of the strikingly positive things about Queen's and the Law School and the Human Rights Centre is the collaboration and successful collaboration that goes on with civil society here. And long may that last. I think in many ways we need more of that sort of synergy between universities and civic society. And in many ways, the collaboration with CAJ is, is a role model really around that. One I'd like to mention, and I've brought along a number of copies of the report, is we were recently involved with CAJ and the University in Ulster in a project called Brexit Law and I. And I've brought along a number of hard copies of uh, one of the research reports around that, which you're welcome to take, a highly influential project uh, among a long range and number of other influential projects, particularly around, for example, legacy as well. So I'll stop here and I will hand you over to Daniel. I was tempted to read out, I, I suspect this is probably the longest title of any presentation in Human Rights Week, but it is Freedom from Sectarian Harassment and the Right to Choose Your Residence, State Protection, State Practice and Paramilitary Housing Intimidation 25 years on from the Good Friday Agreement. Daniel's going to speak for a bit and then we'll have some questions and answers afterwards. So Daniel Holder, thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, we, we deliberately picked a title that wouldn't fit into Twitter. <laughs> that was the rationale behind that. Thanks very much. Thanks to the Human Rights Center. Thanks to Colin in, in particular. Happy Human Rights Week, everyone. Thanks, Colin, for your kind words about CAJ. We did indeed win those prizes. The most recent prize we actually won was a racial equality award from the Northwest Migrants Forum for work on the Black Lives Matter movement. And some of that type of work actually interfaces with some of the issues in relation to state practice that will be, we will be discussing today. The long title, uh, no, so the technology is. Ah, there we go. The long title um, of this lecture is not plucked from the air. It's of course taken from sections of the Good Friday Agreement and the rights that are affirmed in the agreement. And those are rights actually that people will know have been given a little bit of justiciability in recent years as a result of the Brexit withdrawal agreement, providing their diminution relates to Brexit. But two of the rights that are affirmed in there are the right to freedom from sectarian harassment and the right to choose your residence. Now, look, that, that both of those rights have a much broader meaning than the subject matter we're touching on today, but they are very relevant to the subject matter we're touching on today. Indeed, I'm pretty sure that the architects of the agreement had some of the issues that we'll be discussing today in their minds when uh, some of those uh, rights were drafted up. And if you look at them all as a whole, um, they're all about the kind of climate that pre-existed before the Good Friday Agreement um, uh, and the issue of intimidation and harassment for, for thinking differently to the official line or, or daring to live a, a, in an area where you are likely to face intimidation. And I suppose what you can say about the agreement is there was meant to be a bit of a reset there was meant to be a reset. There was meant to be a change whereby you could freely choose your residence. You wouldn't face sectarian harassment by moving into a particular area. And what we want to reflect on today is 20, pretty much quarter of a century on where are we at now? This is a big issue. 
this is a big issue not just for us, but seems to be a big issue for everyone. It's often um, thrown up as one of the greatest ills of our society, the issue of segregation is put forward. In fact, housing inequality is uh, an even more serious issue that's closely linked to segregation and the issues will come in today that gets less of an airing. Um, if you do want to read about that issue, I do recommend two of the reports I've put pictures up of there. Participation in Practices Rights, Equality Can't Wait report, and the Equality Coalition, the Cells and Unison Sectarianism Key Facts report done by Robbie McVeigh a couple of years ago. There's plenty of information about those issues there. Um, the issue of housing segregation drives a lot of narrative, though, and drives a lot of narrative about this place. I'm not going to read all of that out, obviously, but here's some extracts from both the Housing Executive and the Equality Commission. It's fair to say that what's up there on the, the Housing Executive is a bit of a, a two tribes narrative that doesn't really get into the um, causal agency as to why uh, people end up living in. And, and different areas in terms of some of the issues we're touching on today. In fact, very much it presents a view of the extent of self-segregation as if people were somehow just making personal choices, um, which some will to live near family and, and things like that, um, but not to live in areas where, where they're in a minority. It puts up the statistics in 1969, 69% of Protestants and 56% of Catholics lived in streets where they're in their own majority. But as a result of the internal displacement in 69 to 71, um, by 72, that had increased to 99% of Protestants and 75% um, percent of Catholics. It then uh, goes on to give 2011 figures. This is the website from last week, though. This is the shared communities uh, space. Um, it says 80% of households live in segregated communities, rising to around 94% in Belfast. In no place does it mention causes of segregation, other than to suggest somehow people are, are, are self-segregating. Um, I think that's the wrong approach. Um, it's a bit condescending as well to suggest this is all down to, to self-segregating, yet that's a popular state narrative. The Equality Commission's statement on key inequalities, the housing section, this is an old statement. It's, it's removed. It got a lot of criticism from PPR and, and from ourselves because the section on housing inequality didn't actually mention inequality anywhere, and at least into relation to sectarianism. It just mentioned segregation, segregation, segregation. It was a, a, a huge um, mantra, um, not just of the commission, but of various places to focus on the issue of segregation. It says segregation reduces choice, represents insufficient housing allocations, waste of public resources. Um, it inhibits the wider development of a society where people are unable to access public services in neighborhood communities. Research indicates the financial cost to be over 1.5 billion. It's a terrible thing, basically, is what it says. It doesn't actually say what the primary causes are um, at any point in, in that narrative. I think it's pretty obvious what the primary cause is of deterring people from moving into other areas. It's the real live context of paramilitary intimidation. What's interesting is the state doesn't routinely publish these figures, I think. Some figures are now put up on the Housing Executive website, but it's down to the likes of the detail and other journalists to draw these figures out of the state um, as, to how, uh, as to how much this is actually happening uh, and to what extent it's happening. Um, between 2012 and 2015, the Housing Executive figures that the detail got under Freedom of Information show that there was 1,842 cases um, of people made homeless through intimidation, 70% of which was paramilitary linked. In 900 cases of paramilitary intimidation, they determined in their assessment that the threshold of risk of death or serious injury, sounds pretty serious, was met, requiring someone to be removed from their property. Some of the figures give reasons. They're a bit opaque. So 1,292 of paramilitary intimidation, it's got racism down as 122, sectarianism 166, homophobia as 48, antisocial behavior allegations being um, 214. Um, obviously, some of those categories overlap. A lot of the racist stuff is paramilitary linked, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Belfast Telegraph drew out statistics for the following period with over 2,000 cases, 2015 to 2018, 73% paramilitary, around 1,500. 
Um, and indeed, the figures for the last couple of years that have dropped a bit with COVID and possibly with the changes to the, the way things are counted, we're not too, too sure about that. But the figures are still there and they're still pretty shocking. But they do represent a tip of the iceberg. This is just people who have been through the formal process with the housing executive to have an assessment as to the level of intimidation to get themselves rehoused, usually in social housing. Most people will not go through that process, particularly if it's just one family member who's put out, or if you're in the private sector or, or, or something else. And, and look, it's the tip of the iceberg as well, because the actual intimidation um, that happens really is the tip of the iceberg. It's the bigger figure really is about the, the fear and deterrent of living in a particular area that the climate of intimidation creates. So people will make choices that it's not safe to live in a particular place. And this is what shapes housing segregation. Um, and it's well beyond the actual causes of intimidation. But some people will say, well, look, if you look into some of the incidents, it's community demand, there's antisocial behavior, there's drugs, it's communities demanding a response and things like that. And we can say, well, look, for a start, the, the, the correct response to any such thing is not to bring in armed groups. Um, and also quite often those particular issues and allegations are influenced by prejudice, um, sometimes racial prejudice, sectarian prejudice, et cetera. But we know a lot of the deterrence of living in areas really is sectarian uh, and, and racist um, discrimination, or even people who have, have taken fallen out with or taken dissenting views with, with paramilitaries in an area of paramilitary control. The other issue that I'll put up, apologies for appalling language on these pictures that deters people from housing, is expression in public space, some of which is paramilitary linked, either because paramilitary put it up or it's perceived to be under paramilitary protection. The, and this is often a precursor to actual intimidation from housing. It is the deterrent. If you look at the slide on the left-hand side of the picture, that's blatant racist and sectarian intimidation that's expressly about intimidating people from housing and deterring them from putting up, uh, for, from moving into a particular area. The slides on the right are other examples. I'm not sure in the context they were taken that they were actually housing intimidation or just general sectarian and, and racist expression for other reasons, but they do illustrate a broader phenomenon. The bottom two are what Robbie McVeigh has referred to as the genocidal imperative, something that's almost normalized within our society to be able to put up um, kill all Huns or kill all Tags on a wall and for the state just to leave it there as if that sort of expression advocating genocide um, was somehow okay. Um, you'd have to have very good eyesight to make out what I'm trying to get at in the top photograph, which is just an example of flags. The middle one is actually the flag of apartheid South Africa um, that was up on a lamppost alongside a number of, of loyalist and other flags. The public authority response as to whether they would remove that from what is their own property um, was that they would only do it if the community consented to it being removed. So the harms of racist expression are somewhat subordinate to the idea of a community veto. And if you strip back what community veto means, it really means paramilitary veto. I place that example up because we're not suggesting that all expression to do with flags is intimidation from housing. A lot of it isn't. A lot of it's broader political expression, et cetera. But there are specific examples of flags and other items being used for the purposes of intimidation. Let me just give you two. Top of my head, Cantrell Close is an obvious one where you had a series of, uh, of paramilitary flags uh, that precluded UVF intimidation of Catholics outside of what was a shared neighborhood. Another very specific example that we've got in one of our reports relates to the union flag being placed in a, in a street on suggesting the union flag is racist expression in itself uh, in that context. But in the context it was placed, it was placed in the outside the house of the only black family in that street as a clear effort um, to say you're not welcome in this area and also that this is a paramilitary controlled area, et cetera, et cetera. There's some of the precursors to paramilitary housing intimidation. This is rife. It's a serious problem. We've seen it from previous strands. Uh, slides. Um, it's broadly acknowledged and well known when you talk to people. We have an executive, a Northern Ireland executive, we don't have a Northern Ireland executive, but what we have is an executive action plan on how to tackle paramilitarism. This is 20 or 30 odd pages long. It has numerous actions in it. In no place, at no point, does it mention the issue of housing intimidation. That's the next slide. That's the right slide. Um, 
The executive action plan also doesn't write, mention racism, doesn't mention sectarianism. There are no specific actions in there. So despite the prevalence of this phenomenon, there's no specific plan to actually deal with it. You could argue it maybe fits in sort of general culture of lawfulness, things like that, objectives. But it is astonishing that an executive action plan to tackle paramilitarism does not reference housing intimidation at any point. What preceded the executive action plan was the Fresh Start Agreement. And what also preceded it was an assessment of paramilitary groups commissioned by the British government. It was undertaken by Lord Carlyle, largely on information provided by MI5 and the and the PSNA. It was on groups on ceasefire, and um, it then shaped what flowed from it in terms of a panel report and an executive action plan. It actually, in various places, and I've picked the UDA as an example, but the INLA and the UVF are also other examples, provides long lists of areas of criminality in which these groups are involved in. If you look at the ones there, it's right down to counterfeit and co contraband goods as areas. So it's that specific, yet at no point does it mention housing intimidation or indeed intimidation at all, nor does the executive action plan. I think there's one mention of the word intimidation and it relates to organized crime. So there's a big gap in strategic policy. And that brings us to our questions for today, which I'm going to try and answer and then open up to discussion afterwards. What is the state response to housing intimidation? Question one, are persons advised on where it's safe to live? Sure, I'll, I'll answer that one now. Yes, quite often they are. Um, and that includes people who are from outside the jurisdiction who would not know the geography of which areas are under paramilitary control and which aren't, or even from different parts of the North and have moved somewhere else and wouldn't know it. Anecdotally, we know um, that housing officers and others would say you wouldn't want to live there. Um, it's too risky. It's not safe for you to live there, there's a risk of racist or, or sectarian intimidation. If this is known by public authorities, why is it not mapped out as a question so something can be done about it rather than just telling people not to live in their areas, which actually in itself contributes to what paradoxically is called self-segregation. It's not really self-segregation in that context. I mean, what's, what's the problem with that? If it's linked to a particular group, why not name and shame that group? Are they, as a prescribed organization, gonna sue for libel? Um, does, is that information gathered? Does it exist? Let's look into some of those areas. Second question is, is this process of state involvement limited to just verifying if the paramilitary threat is real and moving the victim? Or is there anything beyond that? Let's see where we get with that one. Why are statistics not kept or made available? We've just seen what journalists have drawn out, but let's see what else on patterns of paramilitary threat in order to counter them. Obviously, unless you map something and know what's going on, more difficult to form a strategy to map it. Is that why it's missing from those documents? Are many threats real? Just perceptions are made up. Look, obviously the threats are real. We've seen the actual statistics on intimidation. Are they just perceptions? Well, in some areas they might be. There might be a perception that a particular area is under paramilitary control. It isn't safe, and that used to be the case, and it is now. Things have changed in certain areas, yes, but not in others. Are threats just made up? Do people make up threats of intimidation to get themselves a... Uh, a better house that allegations often thrown out will deal with that as well. And finally, what is the response of public authorities to materials placed to facilitate sectarian, racist, homophobic intimidation from housing, like the examples um, we just saw? So, first slide relates to the issue of how the state assesses paramilitary threats in Northern Ireland. I'm going to look at two sources here. One is the official Northern Ireland-related terrorism threat level. This is assessed on an annual basis by MI5 and is produced on their website on a specific set of criteria. It uses, it's separate to the UK's international threat level. It comes up with this thing of substantial or severe, but there are a number of factors in it. But there's a bit of a critique of this. We have a critique of it, but here's the critique. I've set out from the independent reviewer of the Justice and Security Act, Professor Mabreen, Mabreen Smith, in one of her recent reports. The assessment is related on threats to national security. So what threat is there to the police? What threat is there to state installations? Which is not really, those things are important, but it doesn't give the complete picture of paramilitary harms. You'd have to be looking at, well, what are the threats to anyone in the jurisdiction from armed groups? Obviously, being put out of your house is a specific threat. That's not included in the assessment. 
because it's not a national security issue. And I suppose what follows is that most threats to the state and to state assets and state actors are from Republicans, but most housing intimidation is from loyalists. It's not included in this assessment. And the independent reviewer makes that point. This isn't just an abstract thing though, because the resource that follows from London to tackle armed groups, and you're talking millions and millions and millions and hundreds of millions, um, flows on the basis of this assessment and, M and flows through MI5 and MI5 only deals with one set of armed groups and not the others, the ones that are a threat to national security targets and therefore the whole infrastructure and the money that's poured into it. And yes, there'd be issues about the accountability gap in relation to MI5's role here, but in terms of resources that go into tackle paramilitary activity, it doesn't go into this issue, um, despite the serious levels of housing intimidation that we've seen. The other um, annual security stats are produced by the PSNI and NISRA, the security situation statistics. And as a spoiler, they contain loads of statistics on paramilitary attacks, but surprise, surprise, no reference to housing intimidation. They do mention some actions by armed groups, Republican and loyalists, that are attacks on non-state actors. They mention paramilitary style attacks, what were previously called punishment shootings and beatings, but no reference at all is made to the issue of uh, housing intimidation. There's no desegregation either um, in relation to the source of threat. And let's see what journalists have done with this. So here's, this, here's more from that piece I'd put up about the detail. We've had a whole series um, of articles on this issue. So they ascertained that in nearly 900 of the cases where paramilitary intimidation was reported, the housing executive sought new, and new accommodation due to risk of death or serious injury. That means an assessment has been made that there is a real risk of death or serious injury. Now, if you're making that assessment, you must have some idea as to which group that threat's linked to, whether it's sanctioned by the group or whether it's someone using their authority in that group to, to make the threat. Yet those statistics were not available. The housing executive said it had no information on the origin of paramilitary threats. What? You're making an assessment of death or serious injury. You must know what the threat is linked to. Yet you've no information on the source of threats. Now, charts compiled by the details suggested it's mainly unionist or loyalist areas that have seen the highest figures for paramilitary intimidation. What they did was drew out the statistics geographically, so either by policing area or district council area, and, and, and mapped it to they were areas of mostly loyalist rather than Republican activity. The second quote at the bottom there says, and I think this relates to the, it relates to the five-year period, Despite nearly 2,000 validated incidents of people being forced from their homes due to intimidation in the past five years, there were just 32 convictions for housing intimidation. Housing intimidation is a specific criminal offence, has been so since at least 1969 under the Protection of People and Property Act. 32 convictions, 2,000 <laughs> recorded incidents. So does that begin to answer the question about what are the limits to state response? How many times have the, has the rule of law been successfully applied onto perpetrators of housing intimidation? Not very many, those statistics would indicate. There's more of the same from the policing board. Members of the policing board have given this issue and we've been engaging with them over the years. They've given it a fair rattle, to be fair. They asked in 2016 for sort of threat, so source of threat data for housing intimidation, not housing intimidation, that's just a wee typo. Um, PSNA said that was very complicated and they'd return to it. I don't think they have. At the time, we had the benefit of the annual human rights report to the policing board, conducted by the human rights advisor of the policing board, that would have been Alison Kilpatrick, who was just speaking over the road at one of her other events. Um, an incredibly important doc annual document. I think the, the, the next one will be out soon. It actually had some stats on a very specific scheme, which is the SPED scheme, the Special Purchases of Evacuated Dwellings. This is for owner-occupiers where someone is at risk of death or serious injury and will be removed from their home. The origins of the scheme were protecting um, IUC officers from, from threats, but it's it's gone well beyond that in terms of other forms of housing intimidation. 
Since the Good Friday Agreement, where it's been other forms of housing intimidation, there was still 70 people a year, 70 households a year, sorry, being intimidated in this way and sped certificates um, being issued. Again, PSNI conduct the assessment for who gets the SPED certificate, i.e. they're determining that a risk of death or serious injury from remaining the house. But we're unable to name or give statistics as to which paramilitary organization was suspected as being connected to the, to the threat. Performance committee pushed on this, wanted the extent more reflected. The PSNA response to say was that they didn't collate the statistics. And whilst they could gather more data, it wasn't clear what policing purpose this would serve. Seems very odd statement. Clearly mapping patterns of crime allows you to have a strategy to tackle particular forms of crime. And clearly, at least one senior police officer, I guess it was probably Tim Mayers at the time, did get this and did get what policing policy it would serve because there was, in fact, a heat map on racist incidents that identified hot spots with very significant links to places, i.e. geographically, but also events. If you think racist and sectarian incidents uh, pre-pandemic anyway, were I think 80% higher during the summer months than they are in the but by July than in the pre-summer months. This was part of the thematic review of race hate crime that was produced by the policing board, which itself recommended in 2017 the phenomenon of paramilitary groups targeting minority ethnic communities has been evidenced, but there's no strategy. And it recommended changes that don't appear to have, have happened. Um, we've charted a lot of this in a recent report that Una, who is here, is responsible for, which is the frontline freshens of the of the, of the future report. You can get on our website collaborative research on the impact of immigration law and policy and post-Brexit Northern Ireland with a specific chapter on racist intimidation in there that assesses a lot of this group. But I just wanted to draw out two, two other quotes. One is from the former Chief Constable George Hamilton, who pointed to the irony here is that the loyalist groups working with East European gangsters in the drugs trades, in prostitution extortion, yet it's the same loyalist groups, the ones behind burning out and intimidating people from places like Lithuania and, uh, and Romania and areas they perceive as their own. So that's acknowledged within policing at the very, very highest level, but there's still no strategy to tackle it. NISEM report, Council for Ethnic Minorities, Stephen Lawrence report, written by um, Robbie McVeigh, who's popped up a few times in this presentation. The next Stephen Lawrence report um, recorded the following, that it was astounding that reports by the Independent Monitoring Commission, this isn't the current commission, this was a much earlier commission set up to monitor paramilitary activity, um, which is intended to monitor violence by loyalist and Republican groups, have almost completely ignored loyalist paramilitary involvements in racist violence. So this is a report for the main ethnic minority communities group, NISEM. For example, in the most recent 10th report, it at least acknowledges, this, these were the latter reports of the Independent Reporting Commission, an issue with the UVF and UDA targeting ethnic minorities. But this is in the context in which racist violence perpetrated by loyalists has become routine. So again, acknowledgement of this at, at, at various levels, but no real strategy. And even the then monitoring body from, uh, for paramilitary activity only really making passing reference to it. So where's the current commission at? Slightly different role. Um, it's an independent reporting commission. It's about paramilitary groups going out of business. Generally comments, it's not monitoring as such. Well, to be fair, they have actually put the housing intimidation statistics in their letter reports. There's a wee graph that's from the most recent report. So this issue isn't completely concealed as it is in the way of other statistical bulletins. Um, this is what they have in about the issue, though. We met with a number of groups and individuals to discuss their experiences of racism and hate crime and their first-hand accounts of being victims intimidated out of their homes. Fair enough. The next sentence is a bit odd. Although the perceptions of those we have heard from are that some of those crimes have a paramilitary dimension, we reported, as we reported in our second report, the PSNA does not have hard data on links to paramilitarism present. Well, two issues with that. First of all, I think the anecdotal evidence on the ground is pretty convincing. I don't think they are just perceptions. Second issue is it's correct. The PSNA does not have hard data. The question is why? Why is this data not being gathered and why is it not filtering in to some broader strategy? This is an acknowledgement at the highest level of police that this is a serious problem, but um, the data gathering, as we've seen, isn't taking place. In fact, one of the most useful documents on this issue is a report by the Criminal Justice Inspection, 
and it's a review into the organization um, base two, which is based within NACRO. Just to be totally clear here, nothing of what I'm saying about critiquing the state response should be taken as any criticism of the very difficult work that base two undertakes. The point I'm making is the, 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 the limitation of a state intervention to uh, verifying threats, moving people on, uh, and not doing anything else to combat the phenomenon is the problem. Base two has run a project from 1990. It had more formal housing executive support from 2003. Had around 200 referrals a year, now up to over 1,000. And what BASE2 does is it engages in work that involves verifying paramilitary threats. It also does other mediation, sort of signposting type work. Um, it engages with 60 community-based sources to verify threats, to verify that the threats were actually issued by paramilitaries and are credible and aren't just made up. Criminal Justice Inspector answers some of the other questions. The suggestion that there's widespread abuse, say people are just making threats up, was debunked by this and by the housing executive. Um, also, they were quite strong in relation to the integrity of, of Base 2's um, actions. So what is this process then? Well, here it is. When an individual presents as homeless to the housing executive due to a threat or intimidation, the housing executive will, will request the PSNA to verify the threat and in a number of cases, the housing executive will also make a referral to base two. The housing executive will review this information and all relevant information to decide whether the individual circumstances meet the criteria under the rules of the housing selection scheme for an award of intimidation points. So essentially, whoops, the um, housing executive asks the police. The housing executive may also ask base two for an assessment as to the extent that the um, intimidation does indeed reach that threshold of risk of death or serious injury. That is how the system works. The statistics that don't exist miraculously appear in the criminal justice inspector's report. And these are the statistics the housing executive said it didn't have and didn't gather. Um, except of course, these are only a fraction of the statistics. These are only ones that relate to base two. Base two obviously keep the statistics. They may have they may be able to drill down much further than this graph that has loyalist Republican community, whatever the latter means, um, and go into detail about which groups. So there is some information, at least, with base two referrals. Base two referrals, of course, will be a fraction um, of the overall cases. But the idea this can't be done um, really isn't correct. There's a question of if the state's response is limited to merely verifying threats and moving on the victims of the threats and very rarely taking action against the perpetrator. A, that's indefensible from a rule of law point of view, but equally, is that almost like paramilitary groups managing to subcontract the eviction protests to the state? If that is the limitation of intervention, there are right to life issues here, of course, and, and Article 3 issues as well. And, in the middle of a, an armed conflict, perhaps, though I'm not convinced, in some areas that's all the state could do. But 25 years, quarter of a century on after a peace agreement, is that really the, the, the scope uh, of state intervention on, on, on such a key issue? In fact, there was a proposal during the review of the housing selection scheme to just completely remove intimidation points um, on the grounds that there are some cases of abuse of the system, though that's been debunked as a widespread pattern. Um, had that happened, this phenomenon would be clearly concealed even further um, because those assessments wouldn't be conducted and we wouldn't have any statistics for journalists to draw an out. But the problem wouldn't have gone away in any sense for the people who face it. Um, the housing minister, under a bit of pressure, um, in November 2020, put this to bed and said, no, we will not be going forward with a recommendation from the review of the housing section scheme to remove um, intimidation points. We'll be tightening them. We'll also be making sure they're open to victims of domestic violence. And we'll put in mechanisms that prevent abuse and robust verification and are uh, investigating options for an alternative proposal, including the consideration of a statutory body to independently manage this verification process. We'll update the assembly and on this further in due course, 
Um, obviously, the Assembly's gone now. We're not sure what actually happened after that point, if there's any um, new proposal in train. But in our own view, it needs to go a lot further than just the verification system and review of abuse. The whole approach needs looked at again. Um, the last issues I'm going to pick going to pick up on. How are we doing? So a little bit of time as the issues of hate expression in public space. There's a couple of reports we've done. Um, one um, uh, that Laser was um, heavily involved in on removing hate expression in public space, and the other a conference report that took place um, in the university oh, five years ago now on looking at the boundary between incitement to hatred and, and freedom of expression. The outworkings of a lot of this work are a recommendation in the uh, hate crimes review that was conducted by De Desmond Marion, that there should be a clear and ambiguous strategy to on relevant public authorities um, to take all reasonable steps to remove racist, sectarian, hate expression, for, uh, homophobic, etc., from their own property and where it engages their functions um, broader public space. Here's the human rights law framework and broader criminal law framework for, for such an approach that exists at the moment. Um, as some of you know, there's plenty of positive obligations within human rights law for the state to take proactive steps to remove racist expression and by extension sectarianism. Council Europe and UN have both held that sectarianism here is a form of racism. You can find that uh, more legally binding on, under Article 8 of the ECHR and some good case law on that. You can also find it on the Framework Convention, other UN treaty, uh, Council of Europe treaties, and then other UN treaties. Obviously, we have the right to freedom from sectarian harassment from the Good Friday Agreement. In terms of domestic law, we have the stirring up hatred offences um, in the public order order, which which when when stuff and doesn't have to be spoken can be written, reaches that threshold of, uh, of incitement to hatred. Um, it becomes an offence. We also have the offence that I mentioned earlier on from the Protection of Person and Property Act of intimidation and um, the offence to unlawfully caused by force, threats or menaces or in any other way whatsoever, a person to leave their home. The police um, are under a duty. We know this from the DB case, the sort of short standard notified protest that went to the Supreme Court. There's some level of discretion, but... Uh, that, that has to follow an ECHR framework, but to prevent the commissioning of criminal offences, intimidation being one. We have a lot of procedural duties as well with the Section 75 equality duty. Um, I mean, if a good relations duty was interpreted properly as a duty to tackle racism and sectarianism, it would be relevant to this. But there are procedural duties to consult and screen policies. There are also legal certainty issues when you have a public policy that affects rights. Um, and there must be legal certainty over when the state will intervene, when it's going to exercise uh, particular powers, and you have the administrative law principles that see antithesis of good government to operate a secret policy, and that the rule of law requires a transparent statement for the executive of the circumstances in which it will exercise a discretionary power. So the PSNI had a secret policy for years that wasn't subject to quality screening or consultation or any other formal process. They gave it to us during uh, research. Thanks for that. There's a, there's a copy of it, the operational guidance on flags, emblems, and associated displays. Typical policy statement from the PSNI was that the removal of flags, emblems, banners, not a role for the police unless a criminal offence has been committed. Fair enough, that's correct. Or a breach of the peace may occur. Only then can police interfere, uh, intervene. The operational guidance, as I just said, wasn't publicly available. But when we got it and opened it up and looked at it under the thing of, we can't intervene unless a criminal offence is committed. We expected to see reference to the relevant criminal offences, intimidation, harassment, stirring up hatred. There's no reference to any of those anywhere. The entire document is through a public order lens. And it's almost, um, it relates to who can create a threat. So we'll only take down stuff if paramilitaries are going to riot if it's left up. But we will actually intervene to stop stuff being taken down if paramilitaries are going to riot because it's taken down. This puts us almost in a pre preeds commission situation where whoever was able to level the greatest threat prevailed, but that is the approach being taken. The only reference to ECHR rights is the rights to expression of those placing items, no reference to Article 8 or that broader context. Um, and we've critiqued this. We've said at worst the policy provides for PSNA intervention to prevent persons from placing expression that paramilitaries oppose and protecting expression approved by paramilitaries if they generate a threat of disorder that it's removed. And that's something that's levied in relation to housing intimidation. We looked at other public authorities. Councils do have powers. I don't have time to go through them all. Some are better than others. Some do actually specify and separate out hate graffiti from other sort of stuff. Um, Department for Infrastructure has very specific powers. Um, it's an offence to put something on a lamppost without planning permission. 
um, they've decided not to use those powers according to the PSNA guidance to essentially disapply the rule of law. But they, do, they don't have a formal written policy. Nothing's been a quality screen. Nothing's been consulted on. But they've consistently put out their policy to the media. And that's the expression that they, they normally lose. We, we will take action if there's a road safety concern, i.e. if there's a big banner on a bridge that's going to fall on the motorway, which is a road safety concern. But we'll, we'll remove flags, banners, paint from curbstone signs where there is clear community support for their removal. So again, there is a community veto. And for community read, angry male paramilitary group, because that's what that actually means in practice. Um, it has to be negotiated at no stage in this policy. And the housing executive has a similar approach um, for, for, for community consent, community support, something being removed. At no stage in these sort of policy approaches do they actually look at the harms of the type of expression and separate out what is maybe political expression from what is actually intimidation uh, and, and racist and sectarian expression. That is the um, approach that you used. I have come to the end. Thank you. I want to see, does this, this work? Yeah. My intervention was just to check that the presentation was unmuted <laughs> during that. It's a very excellent presentation. Um, and I'm conscious there's a lot of work CAJ have been doing publicly around this issue uh, recently. And well, so really now I'd hand it over to you for questions and comments and feedback and reflections on the presentation. Maybe if I, while you're warming up, I'll, I'll try and think of uh, something that occurred to me. It's slightly, probably, it's quite a general question, but it relates to the link to the Good Friday Agreement, Daniel. And, you know, as I was listening to the argument and the presentation, I kept wondering to what extent the sort of politics and dynamics of, of a post-conflict society and the role of the police in that post-conflict society was entangled with some of the judgment calls that are being made around the rule of law framework. So in other words, what seems to be, if I'm reading some of that presentation right, is the way in which small p political calculations uh, the nature of a post-conflict society, perhaps some of the public bodies themselves being in dialogue, if you like, with some of the groups you're referring to, and the, to what extent that's all wrapped into some of the things you've said there, were just very general questions that, that occurred to me listening to your, your presentation. Okay, thanks very much, and thanks for the bottle of water. Had that been a glass, it would have been disastrous, because I knocked it over several times. Um, in terms of the Good Friday Agreement rights, First of all, it would be helpful if they were justiciable. There was a vehicle to make some of those justiciable. It was called the Bill of Rights. Never happened. Um, but I think people would have found it a lot easier. Uh, victims would have found it a lot easier to challenge some of these patterns and practices had they been made more justiciable. I think there is a problem, Colin, in an approach to certain types of paramilitary activity that, that to, to borrow an old phrase, involves managing an acceptable level of paramilitary activity um, rather than... Um, moving towards the rule of law approach on, on all of these areas. You've, you have a differential in that there's the dissident Republican groups now are very, very small and very marginalized. But in terms of loyalist networks and loyalism is by no means a monolith. There's huge amounts of transition going on, but there's also huge amounts of this stuff going on. Um, those networks are still vast and pretty intact, and there is no real real effort to, to dismantle them or, or remove the power bases. I think sometimes as, uh, as well, um, Whilst the community of policing approach was at the heart of pattern, it can go badly wrong. If, if a community and policing approach is, uh, involves reflecting and institutionalizing community views, which is important in usual circumstances, there needs to be great care that, that popular prejudice doesn't then come be part of, of community views that's then reflected in policing. I think people know what I mean. Um, but also that that doesn't end up being, that the community doesn't end up being uh, almost a, a euphemism for paramilitary power, because therefore what you're then doing is institutionalizing paramilitary control within the policing uh, structures. It's, as, as it was said at one of our conferences, it's, it's easier to get a gate open um, by going to the gatekeeper. 
um, yeah, in the use of that term, both literally and, and, and metaphorically. But what you're actually doing is empowering and sustaining um, networks and power structures of armed groups rather than um, assisting those who, who want to transition and civilianize away from that. So I think policing approaches can go badly wrong, but this approach of, of managing paramilitary activity, as long as the, the sort of ceasefires are intact, as long as it isn't, but, but that this other stuff is allowed to go on. And there's been some moves on you know, paramilitary crime task force, stopping drug dealing, stopping this, that, and the other, but, but, but what about this? I mean, this is a huge area of misery for, for, for many, many people, and there isn't a strategy to tackle it. Thank you very much. And echo that, you know, much of what we've heard and around this research project is genuinely appalling and shocking, really, to, you know, and it's good that we're having this discussion today. And hopefully, like a lot of CAJ's work will prompt reflection and discussion. So I'm just looking around the room, whether anybody would like to, um, and the microphone seems to work as well. So excellent. Hello, um, Alexa here from the Human Rights Consortium. Um, one, thank you for the, the presentation. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, I suppose my, my question kind of is, what are the steps we can take to tackle this? Because, you know, the uh, in a lot of cases, the laws are there, the powers are there, the police have the power to tackle this, the, you know, Department for Infrastructure have the power to, uh, and, and, and have the kind of legal imperative to, for instance, remove flags from lampposts, et cetera, et cetera. But these are all kind of bodies that, while there are accountability mechanisms, many of them aren't really functional right now. And, and you know, many of them also just don't really work that well um, where, where these bodies and, and how they tackle these issues are kind of opaque um, in ways which you're, you're clearly very well trying to illuminate here. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I suppose my, my question is, you know, passing another law probably won't help because we've got a lot of the, the laws there to tackle this. So what, what will, what are the steps that can be taken by these state authorities um, or, or by us in civil society and in academia, et cetera, to start kind of platforming and, and getting these issues tackled? Thank you, Alexa, for, for that question. In terms of the issue, first of all, of, of like the uh, hate expression and, and public space, we do have a series of recommendations in our report for what should happen. Obviously, the hate crimes bill coming through and that recommendation, recommendation 15 in the statute of GGD, we do think would be a game changer. And one of the things the police will privately um, complain about, is, and in fact, other public authorities do the same, is they don't want to move on their own. They don't want the whole thing put onto them, which in some senses is fair enough. In other senses, well, if there are criminal offences taking place, that is the responsibility of of the police, but I would have some sympathy with the argument that um, other public authorities need to move to. And I think there needs to be political leadership in those areas. We need to be pressing the evidence of some of these issues. And we have presented that particular report to the infrastructure minister, who was very sympathetic, but obviously then left office about a week later um, before any movement could happen. We'd like to see that recommendation of the hate crimes review implemented, but that's going to take years. Even in the best case scenario of an assembly returning and this bill being prioritized, you'd be looking a couple of years. So in the interim, I mean, all of those, I put up those administrative law principles for a reason. I think the, 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 the policy approaches taken by a number of those public authorities are ultra-virus and they're, and they're ripe, are unlawful, and they're, they're rife for challenge and litigation in specific instances. So when people do come across specific incidences of this where there's a refusal to act, I think there is a, a legal remedy. And, and it might be someone being sued finally cracks this. Um, so that's a potential way forward. In terms of housing intimidation, again, similar issues arise. We're trying to have a rattle at all the relevant public authorities doing that very publicly um, to get significant macro recommendations for this situation to change. But again, it would be down to effective individuals as well may, may wish to, to, to litigate about the lack um, uh, of action on this. I think one of the issues is this has gone so much under the radar for, for so such a long time. It's not been given um, the attention it deserves. And I think if we can collectively push it up the agenda, it's such uh, a wrong that needs rated. I've got that right. Um, 
that we might be able to build a bit of a head of steam up um, and get some movement on the on, on the policy framework, which in that sense does not require, as, as you pointed out, additional legislation. It requires the existing legislation to actually be used. Anybody else in the room? Or I'm conscious that there are a number of people online as well who are, if you would like to ask a question, feel free just to indicate and I will unmute you. Um, anybody else in the root question over here? And I'll bring you the mic. So it's 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 for our online audience so they can hear you. Pardon. Uh, hello, teacher from many years ago. When I taught in London, education for mutual understanding. You know, I think there could be some innovative curriculum redesign. There could be an intergenerational input. Uh, there, there could be a program studying a concept like nationhood. Um, widening of perspective. We, we got to get young people, you know, at a stage when they, they might break down the mindsets which they take in by a process of osmosis almost from the parents. Uh, so just a thought from a retired teacher, you know, education for mutual understanding, curriculum redesign uh, in schools. OK, thank you. Thank you. And I think, yeah, when you look at the human rights standards on issues like this, that, that, that there's a, a policing and criminal justice response, but there's a much broader piece, as you allude to. There's an educational response, there's a societal response. There are, there are many more pieces of the of the jigsaw that can can assist in moving a situation on. So thank you for that. Okay, Lauren Banks online has a question, I think. Lauren, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Laura, sorry. Laura Banks. Thanks. You can hear me okay? Yeah, Daniel, I just wanted to say thanks very much. Um it's been a great um it's been a great talk and um you know, it it chimes really with me. Um, I'm a solicitor in the Human Rights Commission and I've been looking at this issue and I've encountered this issue um, and you know I read your report with great interest and just sort of nodding along <laughs> uh, from home with a lot of what you're saying but I just wanted to ask you if you'd encountered um, an issue um, that, that I have encountered and that is um, I've assisted um, actually quite a large number of people now with complaints and so on with, with this um, to, to try to get them intimidation points uh, where they haven't been awarded. And there's been a range of different uh, reasons that, that have been given. Um, but one of the complaints that I've been dealing with recently um, was an individual who was living in a loyalist community um, and he was a member of that community. And he, he was given threats based on a perception of his political beliefs and a perception about his, support for the Irish Sea border um, and the housing executive refused to give him points because they said it's not sectarian if it comes from his own community which I find to be bizarre um, even though there was a threat made to his life which was verified by the PSNI um, and I was really surprised that they didn't seem to have really a policy for dealing with this but but it was um I think it was about a 10 year old uh, definition of sectarianism, which said that it, it had to be basically one community against the other in order to be um, sectarian. Um, and I just find that particularly um, surprising and worrying. Um, and this particular individual can't bring a legal challenge like many of the people that I see because they don't get legal aid. Um, but I just but because they work, you know, but I, I just wondered if that's something that you, you've uh, came across at all. L Laura, first of all, thanks. That's incredibly that, thanks for your kind words. And also that's an incredibly helpful to, to bring that up. Um, we've come across a couple of issues. And I mean, again, very anecdotally, what, one is a perception. I mean, the, the numbers of intimidation. Um, recorded intimidation, successful intimidation claims seem to have dropped in recent years, partly that'll be pandemic related. Some people are questioning whether the, the, the criteria is being tightened up as well. So actual intimidation isn't falling just the way it's it's recorded is. And that's very much a an, an open question. Clearly, there's a pattern whereby, I mean, intimidation is intimidation for, for whatever reason. And yes, there is a pattern that it's not just 
um, because someone's from a different community background or from different ethnic group, but because someone dissents to the official line that the paramilitary group wants and they're put out for that reason. So it's an absolute glaring omission in the um, system if that particular circumstance um, isn't contemplated for. Um, and obviously there's the issues with legal aid and stuff that you've that you've raised, but again, just to emphasize, wouldn't we be in a much better place if rights against intimidation, the right to housing, and the right to housing without discrimination had been incorporated into a Bill of Rights, that would be the particular circumstances of this jurisdiction. There's, and an, there's an idea. It would be the, and it would be the basis um, on which it would be a lot easier to, to challenge public authorities for, for having acted un, unlawfully. Um, but let's let, let's please dialogue further on this because I think it's a very important issue. Okay, I think what we'll do now is draw a line onto the conversation today. Uh, thank Daniel and CAJ for their exceptional work. And I'd like to reiterate again the point earlier about, you know, the School of Law Queens is absolutely delighted to have a long record of collaborating with the multi-award winning, is that right? Multi-award winning okay. Committee on the Administration of Justice. And long may that continue. Also, this is Human Rights Week. And I uh, encourage everyone to attend all the various events. So thank you for coming. And could we all show our deep appreciation to Daniel Holder, Deputy Director of CHA. Thank you, Daniel.